Welcome to Humanizing Pedagogy, hosted by Branch Alliance for Educator Diversity, or Branch Ed, as we're called. I'm Aubrey Evans, the director of the Birch Professional Learning Center at Branch Ed. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we're honored to have each of you here today. And I know that you're eager to hear from Dr. Salazar and Dr. Anderson. Um, today's presenters approach humanizing pedagogy through storytelling. You're in for a special experience today. Um, so we're going to get started quickly after my brief three minute intro. Um, before we begin, I do want to acknowledge the disruption in our lives and the increase in traumas caused by the global pandemic and other things that might be weighing heavy on our minds today. Even though we can't see each other in this webinar format, um, we feel the connection that makes us a community, and that is to make the world a better place through education. And with that, I will briefly share the mission of Branch Ed. It is our vision to strengthen, grow, and lift up the impact of educator preparation programs at minority serving institutions as being central to efforts to shift the 20% of national representation of teachers of color to a much greater percentage of a diverse and highly qualified teaching force. In doing so, we can and will ensure America's children receive the best education and support as possible. Today is the second webinar in our 2021-2022 webinar series on innovative pedagogies. The intention behind this series is to inspire us all to think about educational practice through lenses which center and humanize historically underrepresented and excluded learners. Each webinar features a pedagogical expert. Today you get two. Our hope is that you will walk away with an invigorated teaching philosophy and strategies that revolutionize your practice. Um, so today's webinar is on humanizing pedagogy. Next, we have Pedagogy of Hope by Dr. Tiffany Pogue on November 3rd. Uh, these webinars are on the first Wednesday of every month, except for January. And at the end of today's session, I'll share the link to our events page where you can register for our upcoming events. Before handing it over to today's presenters, I'm going to tell you a bit about each. Dr. Salazar is a professor of curriculum and instruction and teacher education in the Mortgage College of Education at the University of Denver. She has authored 35 publications and given 140 scholarly national and international presentations on humanizing pedagogy equitable teaching and teacher evaluation, and college access and success for Latinx youth. You may be familiar with her book, Teacher Evaluation as Culture, a Framework for Equitable and Excellent Teaching. We're so honored to have the opportunity to learn from Dr. Salazar today. We are also honored to learn from Dr. William Anderson, who is the Director of Teacher Education and Clinical Professor at the Mortgage uh, College of Education at the University of Denver. Dr. Anderson was a secondary English teacher for 13 years and also worked in special education. Dr. Anderson leads professional development on culturally sustaining practices and emancipatory pedagogies nationally. He was a member of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation Teachers Advisory Council from 2014 to 2016, and he's currently a member of the National Geographic Teacher Advisory Council and the Education Leaders of Color Leadership Committee. Uh, before I stop sharing and hand it over to today's presenter, I want to say a word about engagement in today's webinar. Please enter any and all questions in the chat or Q&A. Uh, we have intentionally left both open to create opportunities for engagement, and we will leave time at the end today for presenters to answer your questions. So I will now stop sharing. Well, thank you so much for that introduction. Remember that introduction. Bienvenidos. It's wonderful to be here with you today. And do you want to say just a few words of hello, Dr. Anderson? I want to say um, good morning and thank you so much for this opportunity to present with you all. I am, I'm looking forward to the time. Thank you all. We're going to jump in and make the best use of our time with you. I um, want to quickly just say a few things about myself. You see my credentials here. I always share that up front. Um, I am the first woman of color to achieve tenure and full professor at the University of Denver in our College of Education. Nationwide, le less than 1% of full professors are Latina. Uh, the reason I'm so proud of that is because you'll hear my trajectory and my stories that got me where I am today. I am a first generation college student. And so all of that makes me extremely proud to be here before you sharing uh, my knowledge and lived experiences and my testimonios. 
just uh, briefly about myself, um, not necessarily in contrast, but to just kind of add a little context. I'm actually a fourth generation um, college student with my great grandmother graduating from college in 1921. And all the generations really following her, um, following in, in the footsteps and the path that she made and working. And I try to use my work as a space to rethink about what it means to be a professional in education as well as an academic in the university and higher ed space. Thank you so much. Quick overview and then we'll jump in. Um, Dr. Anderson and I are going to share our testimonials with you, right? Our testimonies, our stories, our lived experiences, because those are important in establishing our work, right? This is why we are both so committed to a humanizing pedagogy. Uh, one, we both experienced a dehumanizing pedagogy in schooling and have worked very hard throughout our lifetimes to shift that in, in the educational context we've been in both K-12 and higher education. We're going to jump into very brief the theory on humanizing pedagogy and then really focus on humanizing pedagogy and practice both in k-12 spaces as well as higher education spaces and then we'll end with our own perspective around the purpose of education and the importance of humanization our objective for today we always start with an objective because we know it's good practice I will be able to understand the need for humanization and education and examine the theory and practice of a humanizing pedagogy in education, both K-12 and higher education. So we're gonna jump in with our testimonials. This is a word that means testimonies, right? This is all about our lived experiences. And Dr. Anderson and I wanna make a case for the need for humanization and education. This may not be new to many of you. You may have many of the same experiences that we do, particularly if you come from historically marginalized communities. Um, the great scholar and poet Maya Angelou said, there is no greater agony than bearing an untold story inside of you. I find it both agonizing to hold my stories in and agonizing to share them as well. Um, one of the narratives, I so thank you so much. Let me know if there's any other issues. Um, so this really is about establishing the need for humanization and education. The story I'm going to share with you is my first grade teacher stole my humanity. And I want to provide a context for you around that. Uh, my family are Mexican immigrants. They brought me to the United States when I was only uh, two weeks old. And my father has a third grade education. My mother has a sixth grade education. My father left school to work on the farm and my mother left school because her father told her she would not need an education because she was going to get married and have children. Um, on the top left, you see my grandparents, Cristobal, yes, named after Christopher Columbus. And uh, he was white, blonde and blue eyed. And my grandmother was indigenous. Although when I asked my parents, they did not know what indigenous tribe because they said everyone was indigenous, but nobody knew, right? That, that culture, that heritage had been taken from them and their ancestry. And so she said, no one ever talked about it. The other pictures are myself and my siblings. Um, there was family trauma in my home. I was six years old. My little brother was five and he drowned in a well and we all saw it. Um, and it caused incredible trauma in our home, including domestic violence between my mother and father and my father and my brother. It was a really tough space to grow up in. In the top right corner, you see a picture of myself and my three children and my nieces as well. And so the family is incredibly important to us. Okay. Well, um, my story is slightly different than Dr. Salazar's, as I said. I came from a family that college and education was a really, really big deal. As I said, a, a fourth generation college student whose great grandmother, grandmother, and both my parents, who I, I would argue are two of the best parents in the world, um, were all about education. Let me let Dr. Salazar in. Um, 
Therefore, by the time I got to the second grade, school was something that I was very used to doing. It was something that I was very, um, I don't want to say advanced in, but my math and reading skills were very much at grade level or past grade level. So when I had a second grade teacher who didn't know what to do with a student like myself, who had a ton of energy and had would be able to get work done. And as soon as I would finish my work, I, I decided that would be my time to mess with other students. Um, I got in trouble. I, I got in trouble a lot and enough until that person, that teacher suggested to the administration that I not return back to the school until I had a psychiatric evaluation. That evaluation led to me being uh, medicated for ADHD for attention deficit disorder, ADD, ADHD, and it completely switched my relationship with school. I went from really, really enjoying school, really, really enjoying learning and being there to, as it says here on this slide, just, just hating school and it not being a place for me. Um, school became socially awkward. School became a place where I did not feel I got to be myself. And uh, as I said, I had amazing parents. I had a great family. I had, I had a great life and I was, I was happy and I was happy in all of my spaces uh, except for school. And it was tough. It was really, really hard to be able to know that at home I was loved and appreciated by my friends. I was loved and appreciated but I didn't have that same feeling from the teachers who were responsible for educating me. And I noticed something was different when I actually did have two great teachers. So through middle school, I had one, it was my social studies teacher, Mr. G, who was the reason I became a social studies teacher, um, who saw me. He talked to me, he, he made connections with me, he, um, he loved me, and he made it okay for me to be this weird, awkward kid. By the time I got to high school, I had the conversation with my parents about how I would no longer take these drugs, and it took a while for me to detox through them, but this is also where I met my second teacher. She was my avid teacher, and she too made me feel okay, made me feel loved. And I was lucky enough to loop with um, her, Miss Delmont, through all four years of my high school education. And it made all the difference in the world and has really helped me ground and center the work I currently do in education. With that being said, I'm gonna send it back to Dr. Salazar to share her story. So thank you so much, everyone, and again, apologize for the technical difficulties. Um, so what I was sharing with you was just my family story around uh, my parents uh, came to the U.S. when I was only two weeks old. And so my father has a third grade education. My mother has a sixth grade education. They were not even able to help me with kindergarten level work, right? Um, additionally, we had some trauma in my home when we were in Mexico one year, my little brother and my siblings and I were playing hide and go seek, and my little brother hid in a water well, and he drowned, and I remember my father taking his body out of the well, it was tremendously traumatizing for the whole family, and my little brother passed away, and we left him in Mexico, we buried him there, and so my parents, uh, when we returned, um, it was a it was a chaotic situation, domestic violence in my home between my mother and father, between my brother and my father. And it was a very tough environment to grow up in. Um, now, transitioning to that, I entered kindergarten, right? That's my first picture, kindergarten. The second is first grade. And you see the third picture is second grade and the last one is third grade. Notice the, the difference in my appearance. Notice how I became assimilated, right? And that's because of my first grade teacher. Um, when I went to kindergarten, that first, that first picture, my teacher, Mr. Lopez, told me I was so bright that I could learn in two languages. It was a bilingual classroom. And I had my mochila, and they had all my treasures inside. 
my language, my culture, right? My Mexican culture, my Spanish language, my family, my ways of knowing, my heritage. And my treasures were so bright that they shined as bright as the star of Bethlehem. And I was so proud and I loved school. And then the policy at the time in the Denver Public Schools was to transition and mainstream. And so it was a sink or swim opportunity in the first grade, right? And I remember feeling that my first grade teacher sent the message to me that she didn't want my mochila in the classroom. It wasn't welcome. She would give me a backpack that would serve me better. That backpack would have the US culture, the English language, US history, according to white norms and ways of knowing. And so I left that mochila behind. I didn't want anything to do with it because those treasures were not shiny anymore. I didn't want those treasures. And so I wanted to stop speaking Spanish. I wanted to separate from my parents. I was ashamed of them. I was ashamed of my culture. And in fact, in the third grade is the last picture you will see there. In the third grade, notice the transition between what I look like. And also I was in the color guard. The color guard was very symbolic. I would take the flag out and raise the flag, right? So look at that symbol of assimilation. So the third grade is the bottom picture. I'm in the top, the little yellow shirt there, right? And this is Mrs. Hitchcock. And in the third grade, I decided I wanted to be white because being white was worthy. And the way I was going to become white was to learn to be a good reader because all the white students were in the top reading group, the Red Robins. So when I was called to the Red Robin group, I was so excited because it meant that the color of my skin was going to change. So I walked up to the front to receive my little certificate and I thought, oh my God, my, the color of my skin is going to change in this moment. And it didn't. And then I went home and I kept looking at my skin thinking it will happen. I will transition. And it didn't happen. And then I realized I would have to live in my dark skin forever. And this is something I write about in a humanizing pedagogy article. I went to school with all my treasures, including my Spanish language, Mexican culture, familia, and ways of knowing. I abandoned my treasures at the classroom door in exchange for English and the US culture. Consequently, my assimilation into US society was agonizing. One of my earliest memories is of wishing away my dark skin. I wanted desperately to be white and I abhorred being la morena, the dark skinned girl. I came to associate whiteness with success and brownness with failure. I was overwhelmed with feelings of shame over the most essential elements of my humanness. And so this is the journey that I've taken to, to preserve my humanity, to reclaim my humanity, and to be sure that children like me do not have their humanity stripped from them. As you can hear, Dr. Anderson had a similar experience, right? And um, he writes here around his experience being medicated, right? Being a black child in white faces. Do you want to share this? Sure. Okay. So I'm going to have him share a little more here and then we'll keep moving forward on the theory and practice. <clears throat> this idea of being medicated was more than just the physical effects that it had on my body, which it did. It uh, messed up the way that I was, was able to sleep at night. I would wake up like clockwork at one in the morning and be back to sleep right at six in the morning, which was unfortunately an hour prior to me needing to wake up to, to get back to school. And then when I got to school, being medicated also provided me with a, an additional label. Um, I'm born and raised in Denver, Colorado, and uh, Denver is an a, a extremely white space. Black people represent only 4% of the population here in the state of Colorado, and maybe about 10 to 12% of Denver. And where I went to school, I was often one of no more than two to three black students in the class. And this medicated child uh, label added an additional othering to the way that I was viewed in those classrooms. And teachers made it very clear that I was different. Uh, I can remember distinctly being in class and, and teachers calling me out in the middle of class asking me, um, did you take your meds today? Or reminding me that I needed to go to the nurse or asking me to come into the hallway. And when we get into the hallway, the questions were not, 
hey, William, how are you today? What's going on? What do you think about the lesson? How come you're, you're, you're disengaged? It was always this idea of um, me acting out had to be tied to this fact that I was not medicated, that I was not on my meds, if you will. And that time in those conversations and, and the relationship that it connected with me to the teachers who were responsible for serving me, as it says here, who I think were good intention. I think very, very few were had these mal intentions, but um, it made the way that I felt about teachers and the teaching experience different. And it has also very much grounded the work that I work very, very hard to be able to do as a teacher when I was in the classroom and in the preparation of teachers and providing uh, insight into how they too can better engage authentically with students through relationships and, and understanding the, the funds of knowledge that they bring with them to their to their classrooms. So this concept of humanizing pedagogy originates from the work of Paulo Freire. It is a revolutionary approach that ceases to be an instrument by which teachers can manipulate students. And so the students are at the core of a humanizing pedagogy as well as their consciousness. Um, in an article in 20, uh, 2013, I identified five principles and I won't read these to you, but just give you a sense of them. The importance of the full development of a child, right? Or a person. <clears throat> if you deny someone else's humanity, it denies your own. Um, this journey toward humanization is both individual and collective, and the goal is critical consciousness. And critical consciousness is really the concept of being aware of injustice in its many forms and taking action. So the next one is critical reflection, and action can transform these structures, right, that are dehumanizing, and that we as educators are all responsible for creating this more fully humanizing space. In my current article that I'm working on in book, I'm working on four pillars of a humanizing pedagogy, and this is how I conceptualize them. I power is the individual strength that one has that also draws from your community strengths. This one is really important to me. People often ask me what made me successful. I have seven siblings. I'm the only one in my family that went to college, and I didn't know anyone in my entire community not cousins, aunts, uncles, neighbors who had gone to college when I went. The only people I knew with college degrees were my teachers. And so I had to find that power in myself and I had to find that belief in myself to move forward because I couldn't wait for others to believe in me. My teacher certainly did not. And my, my parents did not have the knowledge to help me and support me through this, this US society. And so I power is incredibly important. But notice how that individual power also comes from community, right? It's not just, we are not just individuals in the Mexican culture, we pull from our collective. The culture of power is everything we need to successfully navigate US society like linear ways of knowing and writing. The power of culture was were those treasures that I had in my mochila, those shiny, beautiful treasures that I needed to be successful that I could not leave behind. And the power of consciousness then is that reflection and action around justice and injustice and that help for our families, ourselves, our families and our communities. So in looking at a humanizing pedagogy this way, um, both Dr. Anderson and I have been able to bring this into both P12 and higher education contexts. Okay? And so um, I actually will go through some of the higher education ones, but I'd love to start out with Dr. Anderson around how he created these spaces in K-12 classrooms. Yeah, in my time as a high school social studies teacher and in my time as a SPED teacher, I wanted to make sure that my students knew that once they walked into my classroom, they were entering the space that they could be their full, true and authentic selves. The way that I was able to do that was to start by first ensuring that my classroom was a safe space, a space where love was put first, where respect for 
all individuals in this space was going to be upheld, as well as an understanding, a level of community, a, a sense of we are we are in this together. The way that I was able to do that, I believe, was by <clears throat> removing myself from that boss position as a teacher and moving it into the leader and really engaging in any and all of the work that I was asking my students to do. I was working first to demonstrate it, to model it, and to make our classroom a space where we felt safe and honored and loved and respected to all be moving forward in the right direction. What that looked like was us really being vulnerable, us taking off those masks that we were putting, in, putting on every day to come to school and to pretend like everything was okay, to sit around and fake the funk, as, as, as I would often say. And what we did was we had to really get real with one another. We had to set aside the content, um, in particular in those first couple of weeks of school, to take the time to, to learn about who these human beings were that were going to build up the ecosystem of our classroom. The way that I did that was through different activities like these need to know slide presentations where students would have to create a slideshow, a single slideshow with four different pictures of things that I needed to know about them, not, not random facts about them, not the I like this type of music, my favorite team is the Nuggets, not, not that type of info, but the info that as us as a community, what did we need to know about one another? What did we need to know about you and, and what you were bringing to our classroom and to our ecosystem to make sure that we could honor you, that we could understand you, that we could be there for you? We spent the time going through each student and myself modeling this to, to ensure we knew what each other needed. <clears throat> also creating writing assignments that turned into true assessments that add students writing autobiographies of their lives and, and pushing them, challenging them, and asking them to take the risk to write about what got them to school and asking them, what do you think about school? Why do you think this way about your schooling experience? And then me, as the professional in the room, using those writing assessments and using those writing samples to really be able to better understand not only the human beings um, that were coming in, but also the, the students that were coming into the room. I would push my students to do um, activities like struggles and solace, where they would have to talk about the places they struggled in life, why they were struggles and, and what made them tough, as well as those places where they found triumph, those things that helped them change. And again, I was always the model for that. I was always out front ensuring they knew that anything I was asking them to do, that I was more than willing to do myself, and also that I was going to create a space that honored them. And as they took that risk to be vulnerable and to share these stories with one another, that they were gonna be protected, that they were gonna be loved and that it was not gonna create a space where, where they were chastised or, or, felt, or made to feel less than because they wanted to enter this work the way that we wanted to. So Dr. Anderson gave you a good example of what it looks like inside the schools, right? What a humanizing pedagogy can look like in a classroom, in a secondary space. Um, he and I are both working on the One Tri Family Freedom School that we have created in collaboration with community members and community organizations, because what we found was there were some oasis spaces in schools but we didn't see a school-wide approach to humanizing pedagogy, right? The Freedom School is actually offered twice a month on Saturdays. It's offered to children from ages three all the way until 12th grade, as well as their families, anyone in the family, grandparents, um, mothers, um, anyone, fathers, anyone can attend, as well as um, anyone in the community who even doesn't have a child. And so this has been a great space for us to focus on racial justice, education justice, and healing justice. Our goal is now to move the Freedom School curriculum into the Denver Public Schools. So we want to offer the curriculum to every one of our partner schools in our teacher education program. 
And then this way, create a, a disruptive force that really um, helps to focus both children as well and students and parents as well in terms of what it is that we should be aiming for in schools. And so again, this one is focused on racial education and healing justice and it's so powerful to see it done at the preschool level. It's phenomenal to see it in ECE. It's really focused on children loving how they look and who they are and learning about their heritage and learning the language of power behind that. So that's something we're really excited about in these K-12 spaces or P-12 spaces, right? And this actually, the Freedom School actually bridges all the way to, I would say, grandparents as well and community members. So while Dr. Anderson and I are really, um, are really focusing on the P-12 space, we also do this work in higher education. And we do that through our framework for equitable and excellent teaching. This was developed at our university, the University of Denver. The, the FEAT, as we call it, the Framework for Equitable and Excellent Education, is a culturally responsive teacher evaluation tool that blends culturally responsive pedagogy, assessment, and evaluation. And this is a tool that we have been using and we had to create because uh, I've been at the university now 18 years we looked for a tool to train our pre-service teachers that held all of our stories, our narratives, our lived experiences, our commitment to a humanizing pedagogy. And it did not exist. We did not find that. And so we felt the need to create our own tool because what we saw in the available tools like the Danielson framework or Marzano framework were that these tools were not neutral and objective. They lacked an intentional focus on equity, diversity, and inclusion. And they positioned the dominant culture at the center as the standard, the norm, or the default setting. So these tools, these teacher evaluation tools like Marzano, like Danielson, were actually mechanisms that centered whiteness and really fortified white supremacy. And we weren't about to do that in our teacher education program. We wanted to position historically marginalized students, particularly black, brown, and indigenous at the center of our work. And we wanted to interrupt this focus on assimilating our children like they did to us, like they stole my treasures, like they took my mochila, like they medicated, right? Um, Dr. Anderson and made him feel that there was something wrong with him that only medication could solve. And so we created this tool. It is published in the book, Teacher Evaluation is Cultural Practice. And we are actually now in the process of transforming it. Dr. Anderson is taking it and transforming it so it also has a student focus to it. Right now, what you see is dimensions, competencies, and indicators that get us to a humanizing pedagogy. So our lived experiences are in this tool and our focus on a humanizing pedagogy is in this tool. And we really um, think about the importance of assessment. These are our rubrics, what our rubrics look like. They are aligned to the national standards called INTASC. And so we really focus on how we are able to build our students' capabilities and capacities in schools to do exactly what Dr. Anderson was talking about. Right. He was talking about what a humanizing pedagogy should look like and does look like and did look like in his classroom. And what we're doing with a teacher evaluation tool is building that practice and holding students accountable because you value what you assess and you assess what you value. So assessment is key in our teacher education program, teacher evaluation in the K-12 context. However, we also focus on humanizing pedagogy and assessment practices in our university classrooms. And I'll give you a concrete example. And then uh, Dr. Anderson will give you a concrete example and then we'll wrap up so you can ask questions as well, okay? This is a project I have our brand new uh, pre-service teachers do at the beginning of every year when they enter the program. This is the very first class they take with me is foundations in education and working with culturally and linguistically diverse students. We have them do a, an assignment here, an assessment that's called I Quilt and Community Cultural Wealth Quilt. They have to create some representation. We call it a quilt, but it can be any representation of who they are and their identity, but also who the community is that they will serve in their school setting. And so the first two here you see 
On the left-hand side are the students' eye quilts, and they show who they are and their different identities. One student actually, his mom helped him create an actual quilt. So it was pretty phenomenal uh, how he engaged his family, how he engaged his family as well. Um, in the others, here you see the quilts that are of the communities that our students serve. And I told them that they had to take an asset-based orientation because it was called wealth, right? The community cultural wealth. And so they were able to create these representations of the communities they would serve. What they then do is write a paper where they compare and contrast their identity and the wealth in the, serve, in the communities they will serve and add practical connections. How will they teach based on who they are, who the community is and their students are, what are some concrete instructional practices that they can use? So notice how assessment is key in a humanizing pedagogy, right? People often focus on dispositions when it comes to humanization and education. We focus on assessment because we believe that assessment is key in terms of determining that they can do and apply the humanizing pedagogy, not just talk about it, right? I'm gonna bring back Dr. Anderson. He's gonna finish off with you all. He'll uh, talk about how we train our teachers in these spaces, as well as our, our vision of the purpose of education. All right. So I think, as Dr. Salazar has been saying, we, we were really trying to put to the forefront this idea of humanizing the instructional practice of teachers and pre-teachers due to the fact that when I think about my own educational experience, the teachers that I knew cared about me were really interested in who I was as a human being. I had no problem doing anything for them. The work was never too hard. No idea was too big. And what we wanna do is really ensure that teachers, new teachers are leaving our program fully prepared to not only instruct teachers in, in their content, but also to be able to make those connections. That's where I think <clears throat> higher ed is unfortunately missing the mark as this graphic shows. I think too many teacher preparatory programs are doing a really, really, really good job of creating these professionals who can deliver content, but not engage genuinely and authentically with the students. And as we work with new teachers and we get feedback from administrators and, and from teachers who have left our program, where the struggle comes is when in, is with these teachers learning these quote unquote classroom management strategies or, or learning how to connect to their students or trying to engage with them on a level beyond just the content, because we did a great job of being able to get them to teach writing, math, science, social studies. But what we didn't do was spend just as much and just as intentional time discussing with them the ways that they are going to build community in their classroom, the way that they <clears throat> are going to be of service to the communities um, outside of their schools and really getting them to think more abstractly and provide them with instruction, direct instruction uh, around how to engage with students in ways that are gonna allow them to make sure that things like, quote, again, quote unquote, classroom management are to the minimum because you're repositioning yourself as not just the teacher, not just the authority in the room, but as a service member in this room we are, who are who is co-authoring um, curated content for students that they understand is what they need and, and want to learn and that connects to them directly and connects to their community and they can see the through line of how this is not going to only help them in the future but how the content that they're learning today is going to help them today so my, my challenge to all of us is to really start to think more radically about how we can transform our pre-service experiences for new and people interested in becoming teachers to really, really be specific on how we can get them ready to be these co-authors of content and of instruction and, um, and curriculum 
for their students to improve their lives today and in the future. And really this, this idea of us being the ones that push back against a system that we know is and can be marginalizing and oppressive to our students. This idea that uh, they try to bury us, but they forget that we were seeds. This idea um, that we, we are introducing new tools to dismantle the master's house and that we are ensuring that the instructional practice that we are teaching our pre-service teachers and that we're providing for our students is one that's emancipatory and a liberating force uh, in, the, in the world that's around us. Questions? Please type your questions in the chat. And we do have one that just came in. I'll go ahead and read that one. Um, what questions can we as educators begin to ask our students to address and overcome pressing social issues impeding student success in higher ed? Can you, can you clarify, does that mean what reflective questions? Or does that mean, does that intersect with assignments? Priscilla Flores, do you want to um, clarify what kind of questions in the chat? And while we're working on that question, if others have questions, please, um, you can go ahead and enter them into the chat. So she said, uh, questions about their personal narratives and experiences. Now, I'll have Dr. Anderson add to, but we really add that into assignments. It becomes reflective writing um, around their own identity, right? So this example I gave you of the identity quilts and community cultural wealth quilts are key. So it was what are the most salient elements of your identity, basically what makes you who you are, and how is teaching and learning impacted by who you are? And then the questions around the community cultural wealth quilts come around who is the community that you serve? What are their assets? What is their wealth? How can you draw that and bring that into the classroom for learning? How can you draw yourself out and go into the community and learn from them? And what are the implications for teaching and learning? So in all these questions, it really is centered around who are you? Who are the students that you serve? And how can we, how does that impact teaching and learning? And what are concrete instructional strategies that we can see based on your learning? So we always take them from the identity work to the what do I do with it part. And um, Will's great at this too. He was great with high school students really pushing their thinking and questioning. And he's also great at that in the higher education classroom. Yeah, I think it's, it's about creating space for those conversations. It's about us allowing our students, whether in, in higher ed or in um, P through 12, to have the opportunity to share those things that are pressing them, to be able to discuss them, to be able to really um, think about them in a critical way and, how, and for us to honor them and for them to make for those ideals and for those experiences to matter to the education and that we as institutions are also responsive to the the issues that they say are present. So we have a question that came in through the Q&A box and then one in the chat. Um, I'll read the one in the Q&A first because it's sort of in the same line as that previous question. So the question is, I worry that my P12 students will experience humanizing pedagogy in my room, but feel dehumanized throughout the rest of the day. Are there school-wide practices I could employ? Yeah, this is a really great question. I saw this actually in the school where Dr. Anderson was teaching manual high school in the Denver Public Schools, where you would see these oasis of classrooms, right? Where um, I'll give you a contrast. In one room where I had a student teacher, the students were constantly leaving the room. The, they basically told my student teacher to F off a couple times, and they would find any reason to leave the classroom, any and all opportunities to leave. That contrasted to Dr. Anderson's classroom where the students never left the room, 
didn't mess with their phones. When he would tell them it was time to stop reading because the bell was going to ring, they would yell at him that they wanted to keep reading. It was a phenomenal contrast, right? And so um, Dr. Anderson taught the students around challenging teachers and notions of traditional education in a way that was still going to help them navigate the system. So he would teach them how to ask questions and say things like, why are we learning this? Um, I don't, I'm not engaged with this. This is what would engage me. So he very much would talk to them about advocating for their own learning and navigating those spaces. And in his school, they very much looked at a systemic a systems wide approach. I think as, as our student teachers are in the buildings, right, or as teachers are in the buildings, it's hard for them to create the systems. But what we try to do is prepare our teachers to see the system and learn to navigate that system as well. And Dr. Anderson can add to that example as well around, um, well, the question was around when students are in these OASIS classrooms where it is humanizing, but then they experience dehumanization in the school. How do you help teachers navigate that? How do you help students navigate that? I think in those, in those OASIS, it means that part of the work that we do is being real, that those spaces are special, that those spaces are sacred. And in those spaces where they are being humanized, we're equipping them with tools to be able to deal and push back against the dehumanization that they're feeling in other places. So it's not just about us being um, really dialed into our social and emotional wellness, but it's also really about equipping students and teachers with the skills necessary to be able to better navigate those places where they're not going to get the same love and respect that they get in some of our classrooms. So it, it really looks like saying, well, how are you gonna advocate for yourself? What, what does that look like? What does um, engaging with power look like? What are the ways that you can engage in power that are going to be successful? And I mean, it's, it's really about dialing in to not only seeing one another, but being able to make each of us feel empowered to be agents of change and equipping us with the know-how to do so. Wow, that gave me chills. That's a good answer. Here's another question. How was implementing the feat? Did you train the supervisors and cooperating teachers with a specific protocol? And then this is from Jody Moody, and they said it looks amazing. Yeah, we actually, it took us 10 years to build the feat. Um, we started with the research base behind it, right, to make sure it had best practice inside the feat but also it had my lived experiences in it as well. So it was a, a journey that took 10 years to pilot, implement, and then we tested the psychometric properties of the feet. Um, all of that is in the book, Teacher Evaluation is Cultural Practice. And I also have a journal article in the Journal of Teacher Ed around interrogating teacher evaluation if you want something more concise. But it took many, many years, a decade to build it, implement it, test it, and now we are on um, a actually new version of it. We've actually increased the focus on racial justice and critical consciousness. We're working on it, as I indicated, Dr. Anderson's taking it and including a focus on student behaviors. And we'll be looking to implement it in the following year with our teacher education students and start collecting data and share that more widely as well. Um, but it definitely was a process and a journey, but. It's, it's who I am, and I know it represents who Dr. Anderson is, and, and he um, continues to help us and support us in shifting and moving this tool. We do share the feed. It is in the book, and we would absolutely be willing to share the current version of the feed. Uh, what we ask is for an opportunity to do research as well and to see the impact of the feed. Thank you. Okay, we have another question. This one's a little bit longer, so bear with me. Um, Alexandra Neves asked Dr. Salazar, earlier in your presentation, you commented that you wanted to be white because white students were good readers. Um, Alexandra supervises teachers in schools and sees a lot of resistance to be a, quote, good student from the majority of students who come from marginalized backgrounds. Would that be the opposite of what happened to you, students not wanting to identify as white in order to keep their identities and membership to their communities? 
Yeah, actually, my dissertation research was on students acting Chicano, they called it. Um, that was the opposite of what we see in Fordham's research around acting Black or acting white, right? And so uh, Black students resisting the sense of acting white and seeing that as a line to being a good student or successful. With the students that I did research on, they didn't want to learn English because they felt like they would lose their identity around that and they would be sellouts and be called now Chicanos instead of Mexican. And so absolutely that identity piece is crucial. And I think helping students understand that explicitly is very important around um, what are the markers of being a good student? What does it feel like to change and grow and add a new culture? Uh, Dr. Anderson has done research on racial linguistics. And I think it is a great question for him too around this black students he's worked with and, and their vision of black English. Um, yeah, I, I really wanted to add to that in my ideas and the work that I'm doing around changing what it what it means, what it sounds like, what it looks like to excel, right? I think this idea, this cookie cutter image has been put in front of students of like what success looks like. And, and often that image is white, middle class, and it makes it really tough for um, anybody who doesn't fall into that that status quo to feel like I don't want to assimilate to that I don't want to aspire to that so I mean I make it a, a very intentional part of my own practice to really stay truly authentic to myself to really make sure that I can model for students and for for future teachers that I got to be me the entire time like through all my education, through the degrees that I've earned, through the presentations that I've done, through the writing that I've done, my voice is there. I get to be me fully, and you too can be you. You don't have to stop being you to be successful. So for us to, as institutions, to really work on making sure that we're not sending those coded message, messages to students that they're somehow inherently deficient and that they need to change in order to be great, um, it's more about really tapping into that greatness that that's within them, which is why I think it's so central that we get to know our students where they're from their community so we can start to leverage what's there instead of trying to put something else on them that they might not be interested at all that, that's being a part of. Yeah, I want to add to that that I recently did a community based research project with black brown and indigenous students and families around their definition of success. It was really fascinating to hear students of color say, I'm excelling according to your, your um, idea of excelling and success. I have good grades, I'm valedictorian, I have good ACT or SAT scores. And the students saying, but is it worth it? Um, it's come at a cost to my mental health, my time with family and friends. And those students are now starting to challenge this idea of the good student and asking, is that really what I want? Is that going to make me happy in the future? And so I think it is important to examine definitions of students and parents, communities around, well, how do they define success? And, and shouldn't that then help us define a good student according to their own definitions of success? That's a great question, thank you. Well, thank you both, Dr. Salazar and Dr. Anderson, for the incredible presentation and for your creative problem solving around the technical issues. Um, I'm going to put the link to our um, future events here in the chat. Um, and do you have any any closing, any final final words? Just thank you all so much for the time and for the opportunity to share. Um, if you have any questions or comments, please do not hesitate to reach out. Same, and I would, I would love to leave you with something that I often share with our teacher education students around um, the fact that we as educators not only change the lives of the people we come into contact with, whether that's our student teachers, whether that's teachers or pre-service teachers, we change generations. So the power in our hands is phenomenal. We have the, the power to change generations like my teachers changed my life and my children's lives and their children's lives and their children's lives. So. Very, very grateful to you all as educators. Um, please keep doing the wonderful work you're doing, especially in these challenging times you are needed. So thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a great rest of your day.